there was no freedom. People is like have a like really hard life and they go into the jail and then government kill them. The entire Sudanese civil war uh, is started in my hometown. Everybody's corrupted. Everyone is corrupted. There's the rebels, there's all these people fighting. They call you slave. Government don't let to us to go to the church. They came on the land and, you know, they were just, 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 just killing everybody. Well, I talked to my neighbor about Jesus. What they did, they fired on us. So everybody had to jump into the water. Her mother started to believe to Jesus, and then her husband killed her. It was a nightmare getting separated from your parents. That night, we were just seeing bullets. Like, I thought they were fireflies, but they were actually bullets. Her husband said, if I find who talked about you to the Jesus, I'm going to find them and I'm going to kill them too. We escaped and got into the mountains, into the forest. We had actually run uh, quite fast indeed. My parents, they say, like, we can live here anymore. And we found ourselves in a refugee camp in Ethiopia. I lived in a refugee camp for seven years. And we went to the United Nations. I did always pray about getting to a better place. Now that I've come here, I've got the freedom to go to school, um, study what I want, be who I want. You can wear whatever you want. You can go to the church. Here, I have opportunities. I'm studying biotechnology engineering and uh, graphic designing. My master's uh, in accounting. After I finished college, I want to be a lawyer. God always take up the chill and depend on us. I've asked him everything I've ever wanted and everything I've gotten. I mean, I saw how God is good. Let's give it up for that. I hope you're excited about being here today. And uh, I am, and I'm uh, excited to, uh, to start a brand new series today. We're one church in three locations. I don't know if you realize that or not. If you're new around here, you, this is news to you. But we have a location in Missouri City, and they've been in uh, Siena Plantation subdivision all summer at Ridgepoint High School. So I want to say hi to those at Ridgepoint at our Missouri City campus. And uh, also, we have a campus downtown at the corner of Shepherd Drive and Washington Avenue. We call it our West End campus. Campus. And if you're visiting either of these campuses today, would you please go by and see your campus leader? It's Scott Denton there in, in the Missouri City, and it's, uh, it's uh, Josh Hilburn in West End. Well, I'm glad you're here. We're going to kick off this new series. And I know you've played this game before because I've played it. It's if I had three wishes game, you know, where you pretend that you have a genie in a bottle. There's been many cartoons and different storylines along this area of three wishes, what would you wish for? Have you ever thought about what you'd wish for now? Maybe some of you would wish for more brain power, that your IQ would go way up, and that you'd have like a mini supercomputer between your ears, that you'd be able to solve all the world's problems right there as a, a, you know, in your brain. Or maybe it's really, if you get down to it, it's usually not your first wish because you don't want to seem really this greedy, but money has something to play with these wishes. Like, like... Like, but how much money? I mean, what do, you, what do you wish for? Like, if you could get a wish, would you wish for $100 billion? I mean, what would you wish for? And then, of course, we all play this game. At the end of it, we always wish for more wishes. Because, of course, three unlimited wishes aren't enough. We want more wishes in case there's some other need that we have down the road in our life. Well, one of the things that we typically doesn't make the top three of our wish list is wisdom. It's just something that's really underrated in our culture and in, our, uh, in our, the way we do life. And so we're starting a new series this week called Street Smart because what we need is wisdom. I don't know that we need more intellectual capacity, and I'm, well, some of us do, 
but not mo most people have enough intellectual capacity to do life well. And I'm not sure our problem really is financial, although I'm sure some here or maybe one of our other campuses are uh, struggling financially. I, I get that. But I think our biggest need that solves really the, all the other issues in our life is this idea of wisdom. So for the next few weeks here in July, we want you to invite your friends to come to Street Smarts. And we're going to figure out how to apply wisdom from the book of Proverbs to different areas of our life. So today I'm going to give you a little bit of background. This is sort of bonus material here. I want you to understand how your Bible works. So we're going to be looking at an Old Testament book called Proverbs, okay? So I want you to know where that goes. In fact, you can start bringing your Bible to church if you want to. If not, we have the verses up on the screen, but we want you to get really familiar with your Bible. In fact, later this fall, we're going to offer a brand new class at the Richmond campus here called Rooted. And we may offer it at the other campuses as well, but this is a class that allows you to get more comfortable with your Bible and how it's organized and what you can expect from it. And I'm going to give you a little sample of what that means today. So we're going to find out really how our Bible is divided and where the book of Proverbs really is. Well, most people know the two major divisions of the Bible. It's the Old and the New Testament. Now, the Old and the New Testament is split up between the time before Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, showed up on the scene, and the time since that, you know, B.C., A.D., you know, those kind of things. And so we understand that Jesus, the coming of the Messiah, really split time in half, really marked time for us. And so that's how the Bible's marked. Everything in the Old Testament is really pointing to this moment in time where Jesus would appear, where the Messiah would come. In fact, there's Old Testament prophecies hundreds of years before Jesus ever showed up on the scene indicating that the, get the Father was going to send a Messiah or a Savior or a forgiver. And then the New Testament is the story of that Savior, okay? And it's the story of redemption. It's the story of grace and mercy and really how God completed this entire religious system so that you and I could have a relationship with him. So we're going to look at the Old Testament, okay, as we study the book of the Proverbs. And the Old Testament is split up into five different divisions. Now, understanding these divisions will really help you a lot because when you're reading a certain book in a certain part of the Old Testament, you can expect certain things. For example, the first section of the Old Testament is called the law or the Pentateuch, okay? These were the foundational books of the Jewish faith. They are Exodus, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And they stayed out, the, really, the law, the beginnings, uh, the Ten Commandments, all that stuff is right in here. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Then we get to the next section of the Old Testament, and that's called the history section. And the history section is made up of the history of the Jewish people, the Israelites, as they related to God and went on this great journey with him to the promised land. And they are Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Now, those sections of the Bible, when you're reading from one of those books of the Bible, you're reading history. And so it should be read as history. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. The third section of the Bible of the Old Testament is the poetry or the wisdom section, and here we see Job, Psalms, Proverbs. There it is. There's the book we're going to be looking at all month long: Ecclesiastes and the Song of Solomon. Now these books of the Bible are poetic. So they're meant to be poetic. In other words, poetry is meant as a literary form to penetrate really beyond your cognitive understanding and penetrate deep into your emotions so that you feel something, so you connect with something. It's supposed to give bigger analogies, bigger pictures, a bigger beautiful understanding of God and his love and really how to live. And so these books of the Bible, these uh, five, is it five? One, two, three, four, five books of the Bible are all meant to do that. And then there's two other sections. The next section is the major prophets, the, the Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. These are the major prophets. And then we have the minor prophets. Now, the minor prophets, the only difference between the major and the minor prophets, this is uh, 
helpful information is really just the length of the book. It's not importance or that these are major players and these are minor players or this is more important or this is less important. It was that the major prophets were larger and the smaller prophets were smaller in terms of their content in their writings. Okay, So that's the difference between the major and the minor prophets. And the minor prophets are Hosea, uh, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, and my favorite book of the Bible to say, it's so fun to say, say it with me out loud, ready, Habakkuk. Did you do that? Let's say it one more time, ready, one, two, three, Habakkuk. Try to work that into some sort of conversation today. Oh, I was just reading the book of Habakkuk, anyway. And then there's Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, and that's the 39 books of the Old Testament. So so that's bonus material. So be looking for rooted as a way to figure out really more how your Bible structured and how to read your Bible this fall as we begin the fall series of courses that you can take to kind of help you. So let's go back to the book of Proverbs. Now, the book of Proverbs was written by a king named Solomon. You probably heard of King Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived. Now, we know this, that he was wise because it's recorded in the book of 1 Kings which is a history book, right? So in the history section of 1 Kings in the Old Testament, we're told something about Solomon's wisdom. And he says this, And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond measure, and breath of mind like the sand on the seashore, so that Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the people of the east in all the wisdom of Egypt, for he was wiser than all other men. And it goes on to name some of these wise men that were known at the time, but here's the key, that he was wiser than all other men. <coughs> now, Solomon wrote most of Proverbs, not all of it, most of Proverbs, but it was written about 950 years before Jesus showed up on the scene, okay, before Jesus was born. And he wrote on many different topics. That's why we're calling this series Street Smart, because he talked about really how to do life in such a poetic way that it made sense, okay? So the, the thing that we're going to talk about today is this idea, it's really going to do, uh, do every area of your life so much good if you can figure out how to live wisely like this, okay? Here's the street smart lesson we're looking at today, and that is to be a good listener. I mean, over and over again in the book of Proverbs, Solomon talks about being a good listener, which is connected with being a good learner. And, and quite frankly, we're not really good listeners. And what you'll see in the book of Proverbs, quite frankly, is this, these parallel ideas put together to illustrate how important it is to be a good listener. Now, in our culture today, this is very difficult to do. We're trying to be good listeners. I'm a terrible listener. Uh, some of you have even quit listening to me now. <laughs> Anyway, so uh, in fact, one of, the, one of the most popular shows on TV now is The Big Bang Theory, and they had a good little sketch about how hard it is to really be a good listener. And what you'll see in this sketch is somebody really trying hard to be a good listener, but it breaks down pretty quick. Watch this quick, trip of the, uh, quick clip of The Big Bang Theory. First, there was PlayStation, a.k.a. PS1. Then there's PS2, PS3, and now PS4. And that makes sense. You'd think after Xbox, there'd be Xbox 2. But no. Next came Xbox 360. Hmm? And now, after 360, comes Xbox One. <laughs> Why one? Maybe that's how many seconds of thought they put into naming it. <laughs> Can you get the butter, please? Yeah. However, with the Xbox One, I can control my entire entertainment system using voice commands. Up until now, I've had to use Leonard. <laughs> then get the other one. Pass the butter. Get, hang on. I don't feel like you're taking this dilemma seriously. Fine, Sheldon. You have my undivided attention. Okay, now, the PS4 is more angular and sleek looking. No way! It's true, but the larger size of the Xbox One may keep it from overheating. Well, you wouldn't want your gaming system to overheat. No, see, well, you absolutely would not. And furthermore, the Xbox One now comes with a Kinect included. Included? Yes. 
not sold separately. You, although the PS4 uses cool new GDDR5 RAM, while the Xbox One is still using the conventional DDR3 memory. Why would they still be using DDR3? Are they nuts? You, <laughs> See, that's what I thought. But then they go and throw in an ES RAM buffer. Oh, wait, wait a second. Who's they? The Xbox. You're kidding! No, I am not. And this ES RAM buffer should totally bridge the 100 gigabit per second bandwidth gap between the two RAM types. This is a nightmare. How will you ever make a decision? You see, I don't know. What should I do? Please pass the fire! <laughs> <laughs> Does that sound like uh, some conversations you've had with your teenagers? I mean, I mean, it's just like I'm trying to really stay focused and interested here, and I'm kind of over the top. But being a good listener is really, really important. Now, let me just tell you one more thing about the proverb. Proverbs is a book, and then we'll, we'll get to this idea of being a good listener. Proverbs takes the position and, and really presupposes, I wrote it down here, that God is the creator of the universe and all meaning is found in a relationship with the creator. So the wisdom literature that we're about to, to look at here presupposes that God is in charge and that he's the creator and he created with wisdom in mind. And living with wisdom, living wisely, makes our life better. So we become street smart. So how to become a better listener? I, I know I'm not alone when I would recognize the fact that I'm just not a very good listener. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that. So this pa these passages of scriptures from Proverbs really helps me a lot. Let's look at the first one. It's in the first chapter of Proverbs. It says this, my child, listen when your father corrects you. Don't neglect your mother's instruction. What you learned from them will crown you with grace and be a chain of honor around your neck. Now, what, what I want to point out here that's really, really important for us is that listening is a responsibility that's placed upon each and every one of us. In other words, what, 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 what Solomon's saying here, what the wisdom literature is indicating is that you have to take up the responsibility to be a good listener. You have to want to be a good listener. And what else is, is obvious here is that listening and learning are connected. There, you can't be a good learner if you're not a good listener. And so the idea here, of course, every parent now wants to memorize this scripture and quote it to their children, especially as they get into those middle school and high school years. But the wisdom here is this, that your parents know more than you do, and they're trying to make the best life for you possible. And if you'll listen to them, especially when they give correction, which is very hard to do, uh, to listen for correction, and then no, don't neglect their instruction, then you're going to learn from them, and that learning is going to be applied. And when that learning is applied, what happens is you live a better life. It, it, the, the poetic nature of it is you'll have a crown of grace and a, honor, uh, of, uh, and a chain of honor around your neck. I mean, it's just basically saying, now, now remember that the Proverbs are generalized. I mean, they're, they're not specific, but the generalization here is that your life gets better when you learn how to listen and learn. And it's a skill that you've got to develop. And you've got to value it. You've got to be able to say to yourself at some point, I, I know most of us don't say this to ourselves, but you've got to be able to say, I want to be a better listener. I want to listen well. I want to be a good learner. I mean, everybody has said, you know, when you stop learning, you get very, very rigid. And so the, song, the proverb here is telling us, listen. Listen to the instruction that you've been given. Learn, apply it, and good things will happen. That's a very generalization of what it is. And then he gives us a little bit more specific instruction in chapter 2. Look at what it says here. My child, listen to what I say and treasure my commandments or my commands Tune your ears to wisdom and concentrate on understanding. Cry out for insight and ask for understanding. Search for them and you, as you would for silver. Seek them like hidden treasures. Now, in this passage of Scripture, I've taken the liberty of dividing this up in a couple of ways so that you and I could kind of understand how do we do this. I mean, really, just saying I want to be a better listener probably 
isn't enough. But the, 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 the quest here is, my child, listen to what I say and treasure my commands. I mean, the idea here is that when you do this, when you're a good listener, it draws you into other people in an intimate way. I mean, being a good listener is the thing that builds intimacy. Everybody here, I can tell you this, including me, everybody here wants to be heard. And when we're not heard, it's really devastating for relationships. This is why somewhere along in those teenage years for children and parents, there's a real crisis point where children become young adults and they want to be heard. And parents who don't update their resumes on the developmental nature of their children don't hear them as young adults trying to figure out how life works. Instead, they disc discount their opinions and their vision and their perspective of life because they're children. And, and so what happens a lot of times, and it certainly happened in our home as our children were growing up, is I wasn't a very good listener to my children as they grew up. I wasn't really attuned in that. I was kind of in charge, and I, was, I had the power seat, and so I didn't have to listen if I didn't want to listen. It's funny, though, my children were forced to at least appear to be listening when I spoke, only to realize later that they were never really listening to begin with. So what I want you to see is being a good listener is an intimacy builder in your life because the people in your life feel heard. And when they feel heard, they feel treasured and loved, and they feel connected to you. And they, they, and they, feel, they, they feel this bond that's happening, that, that everybody wants to know somebody gets them. You know, somebody gets them. Like, this person really gets me. The opposite is true as well, however. When you're not a good listener, when you don't really, you know, put forth the effort and develop the skill of listening, then it really... Uh, kills intimacy. In fact, Proverbs says this in Proverbs 12. It says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. You know, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. And the truth is this, that when we don't listen well, we push people away and we're foolish. That's a very foolish thing to do. One of the most core needs that you and I have is to be in relationships with others. I mean, we have this need to be loved. And one of the ways, the major way that we feel loved is when, we're, when we felt hurt. So I want you to leave here today with this goal. I'm going to be a better listener. I'm going to really take this next few weeks, months, and years, and, and I'm going to excel in listening. And if you're honest like me, listen, I'm kind of an outspoken person, right? I mean, look, look at what I do for a living. I'm kind of an outspoken person. And so my main concern, if I'm real honest with you, tends to be to be heard. And as I've grown uh, in my relationship with my children and uh, with my wife, Lisa, what I've discovered is the most important thing isn't to be heard. It's to, it's to hear. And so... I want to take just three ways this proverb tells us that we could get better at listening and see if it doesn't make sense to you and see if you can apply it. Here's the first thing it says. It says that we have to have this value. I mean, just leaving here today, valuing the, the function of being a good listener is going to help you. I mean, we've got to value because here's what the proverb says. It says, my child, listen to what I say and treasure my commands. This person is connecting the idea of listening and value. So when you're listening to somebody, what you're saying to them is, I value you. And when you're not listening to somebody, you're saying, I don't value you. This is why it's so connected with our relationships and our intimacy. If, if, we're, not, if, we're, heard, if we're heard, we feel connected with, and if we're not heard, we feel disrespected in some way that we, that we value. Now, this is an important lesson for all of us that we feel like what we have to say is so much more important than what the other person has to say. And so we end up not being a good listener. And all you have to do is change your perspective a little bit by saying this, that this person that's speaking to me, whether it's my wife or my children or my boss or my coworkers or whoever it is in my neighborhood, even though uh, they're probably wrong or whatever it is that you're predisposed to think about this person's opinion, I'm going to be a good listener. 
It'll do wonders for you because what you're saying to that person is, I value you. And so you focus in and you value that person and you, you connect with them in a way where the, the, they're heard. Now, this takes a lot of self-denial. I mean, I, to me, I'm very pragmatic in this. And I find myself in the middle of a lot of conversations saying, who cares? <laughs> you know, who cares? I did tell my daughter one time, this is a really bad thing to say, but I was telling my daughter, and my daughter was uh, very verbose. She, she told a lot of details and a lot of stories, and um, especially as she was in elementary school and, and middle school, she'd tell me all about it. I'd, I, I'd say something very neutral, like, how was your day? And man, it was war and peace, you know? I mean, it was this whole big diatribe. And one time I said, she reminds me of this from time to time, uh, as she talked at, at the end of whatever she was saying, because I had tuned out, uh, you know, minutes, uh, you know, 30 minutes earlier, she said, well, what do you think? Well, I had no idea what she said. <laughs> so it was like, what do you think? And so the only thing I could come up with was this. I said, well, Madison, I think it is so much more pleasurable for me, when you tell a story, to have a point. <laughs> yeah, I don't recommend you saying that kind of thing. Just have a point. Like, what's the point? I am like a kind of person that speaks and hears in bullet points. So what's the point? And it's such a bad mistake. Because most other people don't speak or hear in bullet points. If I get a long email from you, the church, uh, somebody else is probably going to read it and get it down to what I could understand. I've got ADD real bad, so this is a problem for me. So I want to value you and hear you, but i got to hear it in short segments. And so it's a mistake. So the mistake I made is say, have a point. She didn't want to have a point. She wanted to be heard. Now, here's one other thing. This is, this is free sermon material here. I, I think... Our country as a whole has lost the ability to have a conversation. I think we're so busy shouting at each other, and we've so discounted each other based upon your worldview or your political position or who you voted for or who you're with that we totally discount and devalue each other to where now we just stand on the corners with signs shouting one another down. Believing that our country or our lives are going to be better if our voices are the loudest or the most powerful, or we can oppress others with that opinion. I don't know how you think about this, but what's lost in the mix is conversation. Because conversation requires me to value you, even though I know you may not, probably don't, see the world the way I see it, and you don't share my Christian values possibly, or you don't um, share my biblical worldview, and we don't share the same things. But could we talk to one another in a way that allows each other to be heard so that we could learn at least the other's perspective instead of just discounting each other as idiots or crazy people or morons in some way and not listening at all. We're losing something terrible. In that, I don't, that's free, that's free. So we want to value each other, and when we listen, we're communicating value. The second thing here is this purpose. Listening requires a purposed effort. Here's what it says tune your ears to wisdom and concentrate on understanding. You've got to tune it in. Did your mom ever say to you, my mom said this to me from time to time, do you have your ears on? Now, as a child, you're kind of a literal thinker, so you're checking, right? You know, do you have your ears on? You know, that kind of thing. It's that, that kind of deal. So the, 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 the Solomon here in Proverbs saying, tune in, purpose this. This is why at the dinner table for us, as our kids were, it got all into the cell phone and gaming, and we were trying, we, we said no texting at the table, no phones at the table, no electronics at the table. We even went a step further that when our kids were growing up, we did a thing called No Media Monday. No TV, no radios, no electronics at all. We did this. Everybody in the house, including me at times, hated this idea because boredom set in, and you had to be forced to talk to each other, which was really 
really the point in the beginning. And what happens is there's so many distractions in our daily life that listening to other people has a very difficult time of succeeding. You know, one of the most important things that you can do is to make sure you're communicating. You're important to me. I'm going to put my cell phone away. I'm going to turn it off. I'm going to make sure that nothing distracts because the most important thing in this moment in time is you. What do you have to say? I want to listen to you. And it's funny how our body language gives away when we're not listening at all. So, so, so the proverb here is tune in. Put your ears on. Sit down. Turn the television off. Tell your children to uh, take a break because you have a conversation to have with your spouse. Don't interrupt. And somehow purpose by tuning in what it is that you're doing. Now, here's the other thing that I would say about being purpose. is what you're listening for. Now, for me, I'm, again, a literalist, and so I'm listening for meaning, which is a big mistake. I, I want to have understanding. That's not the mistake. The mistake is so much more is being communicated than just meaning or just information. So I've learned through some counseling that my, um, my job in listening is to first purpose and put my ears on, but what am I listening for? I'm listening for emotion. Because when I just listen for meaning, what happens is my brain starts um, working this way. I start thinking, well, you're wrong. You misunderstood. You don't get it. You're, you're incorrect about that. And I'm already uh, uh, sort of putting together my uh, rebuttal to what you're going to say. I've learned to keep my mouth shut long enough to listen to her, but I've already got my rebuttal working. Well, once my rebuttal is working, I've quit listening. Now, I may still be tuned in in my eyes, but my wife knows I'm not listening. I'm already thinking about what I'm going to say. In fact, we've learned to say to each other, I'm sorry, I wasn't listening. I was thinking about what I was going to say next. I mean, that's kind of what the ideal here is. And what this proverb would say is, baby, you listen for emotions like with Lisa, I'm now listening not just for the information she's given me, uh, uh, but I'm listening for uh, her hurt. I'm listening for her fears. I'm listening for her pain. I'm listening for insecurity. Because those are the things that she really wants me to address anyway. It's typically not the data, it's typically not the information, it's typically not the narrative. It's typically the emotion that's driving those things, that if I address those things by saying, I'm sorry you feel that way, that must be hard, that must be painful, that must be scary. I had no idea. I don't feel that way. T tell me more about that. You know, that, that's the kind of idea that draws our marriage close together. And when we're just addressing information by saying, well, you misunderstood, you didn't get it, you didn't listen to me, you should have followed directions. Now it becomes this very empirical thing and not this emotional thing, but relationships are built on emotions, right? Not just data. So we've got to learn to listen for people's heart. What are they really saying? What are they really scared of? What do they really believe? What's going on here? And address that. Here's the last thing, and I'll be done. We have to learn how to ask good questions. Here's what this, the proverb says. Cry out for insight. Ask your questions and ask for understanding. Listen, we don't hear well, and so you've got to learn how to be able to come to a place in your life where you say, listen, here's what I hear you saying. Here's what I believe. Here's what I've heard. Is this correct? Is my understanding right? Here's how I believe you feel. Is that true? We've got to ask for clarification. We've got to ask for people to tell us more about that. We can't just assume we understand. How many times have we had a conversation thinking that both persons, me and another person, totally and completely understood what we were talking about, only to go our separate ways to find out much later, and probably in some sort of crisis, that that's not what they understood or what they believed. That's not what they heard. So this requires time. And in our rush culture, listening is a lost art because we just don't have time. Just give me the information, text me, tweet it to me, download it to me. I'll take it, I'll apply it, I'll get it on with it. But that's, that's a relationship killer. We have to be able to make time for each other in a way that we can say, let's have a conversation. Let me ask you, is this what you're saying? Is this what you mean? My wife is so good at this. Lisa is an expert listener. I would say she came 
um, to it naturally, but I think through those early years of her marriage, I talked so much she had to learn how to do it. And she's learned how to listen to my heart, not just to try to solve my problems. That's my deal. I'm a problem solver, so she tells me something, I want to fix it. She's learned now that's not really the goal, and she listens to uh, my concerns, and she sees the heart underneath it, and she says, I know how that feels. Because she's such a great listener, she's teaching me how to be a great listener, and she asks good questions. She says, this what you would like me to do? Would this be helpful? Would it be helpful if I changed my schedule and spent some time doing this? Would this be in this helpful for you? And those questions that she asks are so right on for me. We still miscommunicate. We don't have a perfect marriage. Please don't hear that. But, I, but I'm saying is that this is the idea that if you want a better life, the street smart thing to do is be a better listener. We all have some improvement to do. So don't leave here today and go, I'm a really good listener because you've missed the whole point. Because if you're a good listener, you could be a good learner. If you're a good learner, you're going to grow. And if you're going to grow, things are going to get really good for you in many different areas of your life, at your job, with your children, in your dating relationships, with your spouse, you know, in a crisis. I mean, that's really the thing. We don't listen well because we have all these filters. And we've got to figure out how to simplify our lives enough to sit down and have a conversation, to look each other in the eye and say, I want to listen to you. I hear what you're saying. I believe it. I'm connected. I'm with you. I value you. I'm purposing this time together. Let me ask you a few questions to follow up on. So value, be purposeful, and ask good questions. And you'll be street smart enough to be a good listener. And um, you'll live with great wisdom. Let's pray together. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, we just confess our need to talk. And I'm confronted even in this moment that Really, the issue is I need to listen. I need to keep my mouth shut and listen. And I need to do that not only with my spouse and children and coworkers and neighbors and friends, but I need to do that with you. I'm so interested at times telling you, God, what, what's going on, and, and I need to listen. I need to be quiet enough to get to a quiet place where I can hear. So may we slow our pace down. And I know sitting here or in Missouri City or... Uh, even in um, West End or online, people are sitting there with the hurt and the pain of not being heard. So may we be a people, because of our relationship with you, that listens well. Just as you pray right now, why don't you just make some sort of declarative statement to yourself and to God that you're going to purpose being a better listener. Just say, God, I want to be a better listener. Father, thank you for grace and mercy, and thank you for always hearing our prayers, and thank you for always hearing it correctly and accurately. May we take that as a challenge for us in all of our relationships to be really good listeners. Not reactionary, but we can listen. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.